My name is Caledonia Curry, and I just want to let you know that today I'm going to talk a little bit less about art stuff and a little bit more about life stuff. And I'm going to take it back to the beginning, not in the interest of wildly oversharing, although warning, it is about to happen. The reason that I'm going to do that is because I have something really dear to me that I'm about to ask you. And I want to take you, it's really deeply rooted in my life, and I want to take you to the place from which I'm asking you this thing first. So, oh, you know what? I don't have a slide clicker. <laughs> Okay, so as an artist, um, I go by the name of Swoon, and I've done installations and community-based projects all over the place. What people know about me is that I'm that female street artist or that I'm that artist that crashed the Venice Biennale in homemade rafts. What I don't really talk about very publicly, but I want to talk about today, is that I was born into a family of severely heroin-addicted parents. So my very first memory of my father is chasing him down a dark road at night. He's covered in blood, he's loaded out of his mind, he is a raging bull of a man. My very clearest childhood memory of my mother is being dragged terrified out into the street as she screamed up at the sky believing the aliens were coming down to eat every last one of us. She weighed about 90 pounds at this point, she had been consuming only alcohol and no food for weeks on end, and she had lost her mind for the time being. And my parents split up when my dad was taken away by the SWAT team. He had been essentially barricaded into our house, sleeping, carrying a shotgun in his hands at all times, even when he slept, which was not very much, until his sister called the police, afraid he was going to kill his wife and children. So this was a really dark place in time with a lot of truly suffering people. I visited my mom in rehab. I visited her in jail. I visited her after suicide attempts in the psych ward, strapped down, totally covered in bruises from resisting her restraints, screaming at the top of her lungs for somebody to rescue her, and me not being able to rescue her. So, and in my mom's family, this is just the beginning of stories like these. But as you can probably imagine, this isn't the whole story. Um, my dad came out of rehab a changed man, and he became a force of stability in my life. And in my mom's life, there comes a somewhat temporary burst of optimism when I'm about 10. She's kicked heroin and the alcoholism that nearly killed her. And my little brother is born. He's the most amazing bundle of joy I ever saw in my life. And around this time, she takes me to a painting class. Now, we're in Florida. So we're talking retirees and happy sunset paintings. And these guys take me in, and they teach me how to paint with oil paint on canvas like a big kid. And these old folks ain't taking no excuses off of me. When I say, oh, I don't know if I can do it. I'm only 10. They say, uh-uh-uh, you are just as good as any of us. You don't hear me saying, oh, I can't do it. I'm already 80. So this is really the beginning of the rest of my life. The story that you see in the pictures begins here. I've fallen in love with something, and this thing never lets me down. Whatever I give to it, it always gives back to me. It becomes my safest place. And it becomes a place that I can go to to explore something different every time. And so I start to develop this really intense sense of self-worth from being really good at something. And lucky for me, at this time, my family can really flow with it. They go with all my crazy ideas. This is where I sort of realize that being a bit of an outcast sometimes has its value. You know, like, sometimes I'm 17, and I'm in Daytona Beach, and I decide that I want to be an exchange student in East. Eastern Europe. And I don't have any warm clothes or any luggage to get myself there. And so my mom starts digging through my stepdad's painting trucks at the end of the day and pulling out hundreds of like cigarette packages, you know, the kind where you can tear off the Marlboro miles and get things. So she just collects thousands of these until she gets me this like massive red coat, huge red luggage, all this stuff. Everything's written Marlboro gear all over it so I can get to Europe like a big nerd in this kind of corporate sponsorship gear because <laughs> my mom really wanted me to leave our small town and to learn things that she couldn't teach me. Because the thing about my mother is that, yes, she was criminally negligent so much of the time. And if child services had been paying any kind of attention, she definitely would have had her children taken from her on multiple occasions. But the thing about her is that all, she was also this wonderful, childlike person. Her laugh would lighten up anybody in the room. This tiny little woman, big black curly hair, huge dimples, you know, mischievous, totally eccentric. And in her better times, she really instilled in me a deep sense of the importance of kindness towards your fellow man. So as she was such an unusually sensitive person. I remember one time I'm in a painting class. It's about 1990. The Gulf War has just started for the first time. And as news of the invasion starts coming in over the radio, we hear a knock at the door. It's my mom. She's arrived early. And she's crying. And she's saying, Callie, they just started dropping bombs in Iraq. I can't sit here and listen to this and think about what's happening. Can we just go home? And I just really remember this sensitivity as almost like the opposite edge to the double-edged sword of her addictions and her negligence. Um, so 
this was a really complicated person. And this really complicated person gets me to Eastern Europe to be an exchange student, to New York City to study art. And I get there, I go to Pratt Institute. I feel like the luckiest girl in the world. I'm working two jobs, I'm absorbing everything. It's really amazing. But at the same time, I start to get this feeling where I'm like, okay, this art world, I don't know who this world was built by, and I don't know who it was built for, but I have a feeling that maybe it's not teenage girls from mentally ill, drug addicted families in Florida. So in this place where you're getting the sense that this world is not quite for you, I start to get the feeling, okay, I have to invent something that's mine. And the first action that I do is I start creating a series of portraits out on the streets of New York City. Um, and this really simple action leads me down a whole path. All different projects and collaborations start happening. And my sense of possibility at this point is really growing exponentially. And so I find that I am able to create kind of installations in the more traditional art world settings like museums and galleries while also knowing that if what I need to do in my heart of hearts is build six junk rafts out of New York City garbage and take this whole mess floating down the Mississippi River with 30 of my best friends, then that's what we're going to do. So with each project, my sense of possibility is growing. Um, in 2010, after the earthquake that destroyed so much of Haiti, with a small group of friends collaborating with one village just outside the epicenter, we were able to start digging foundations and building earthquake safe structures at a time when most of the big NGOs were still stuck trying to get their materials out of customs. So over and over again, I'm coming up against kind of our culture's good common sense about what's possible and what isn't. And with a little stubbornness, I keep finding paths through what seem like impassable situations. But at the same time as that in the outside world, almost nothing seems impossible. Back home, my mom is still blacked out on the floor. She's addicted to methadone and any other drug she can get her hands on. And she's spiraling deeper and deeper into mental illness and suicidality and obsessive compulsive disorder. And nothing has ever worked for her. And nothing has ever changed. And then about two years ago, a friend sends me a link to a to a video by a doctor named Gabor Mate. And he says two things in this video which really catch my attention and which essentially change my life. He says that almost all of his intensely addicted Skid Row patients have a severe history of childhood trauma. And then he also says this really simple and compassionate thing. He says, addictions always originate in pain. And so the question is never really why the pain, why the addiction, but why the pain. And so this really turns my head around and it sends me on a research track trying to understand addiction and trauma and violence and mental illness and the relationship that all of these things bear to each other. And I realized that I actually had no idea why my mother and most of her siblings were such disturbed people. I just assumed that it was in the genes and that it was one day definitely going to happen to me. And I realized that I hated my mother for never being able to get it together and get sober and be the person that I needed her to be. And so the more I started to learn about the relationship between addiction and trauma, I started to think, wait a minute, maybe this too is not inevitable. You know, maybe there's a cause to this effect and maybe we can stop these cycles by prioritizing the healing of people who've been so psychologically damaged and by destigmatizing the trauma. And so my research process is growing more and more frantic, and I kind of feel like I'm racing against time to put together this puzzle. And then about six months ago, my mother was diagnosed with terminal lung cancer. And about three months ago, she died. So in my process of working to forgive her for all of the harm that her addictions had caused, she was able to actually open up to me for the first time and tell me her own life story. Caught between a sexually abusive uncle and an emotionally abusive mother, she had had so much trauma in her life and so little solace that she turned to heavy drinking at the age of 14. Um, my mother died before I was ever able to even try to help connect her with people who may have been capable of helping her heal, but I did see that that race against time had been to get to a place where I could understand her and forgive her and love her unconditionally. But the thing is that the pressure of what I started is still with me. I never saw what it had, would have been like if we had lived in that more compassionate world, you know, the one that talked openly about the connections between mental illness and violence and addiction, and the one that thought not as much about punishment and about hating these people, because as we just heard, those systems do not work, our systems of punishment. What about the world that thought more about connecting each of us with the resources that we need to heal and to change our behaviors? So yes, it's too late for my mom, but I still feel really determined to see what kind of world we can create if we allow this kind of thought change, which is so akin to a kind of forgiveness to open up inside of ourselves. So all of us is here in this room because we believe in social change, right? We want what we do with our lives to make a difference. We've got people starting businesses because they're looking for ecological alternatives. We've got leaders in media who've had a wake-up call about the real 
the real, the real, what their media, what their media can can do, and so we're all here in so many different ways. And the thing that I want to ask you is how you can allow this kind of change in thinking and this kind of change of heart to become part of your understanding of the world, and then what actions are going to follow when you do. So I just want you to imagine for a moment that you no longer have the shield of looking at an addict or a homeless person or even a violent criminal and thinking, oh, that person is bad, they're just wantonly rotten, or maybe they were born genetically evil. And instead you just ask, why the pain? Why is this person suffering so deeply that they've not yet been able to heal? And what can we as a society do to help them heal? So if I'm a grant maker, what can I do? I can fund therapy programs for prisoners so that they start getting a chance to tell their story and to heal from the wounds that they've sustained and to stop inflicting this pain on others. If you run a school program, you can facilitate an open discussion about the relationship between trauma and mental illness and the relationship between alienation and addiction. Myself as an artist, beginning to tell this story publicly is a first step. And I'm just gonna show, share with you a slide of a portrait that I made of my mother after her death. So, you know, we're talking about breakthroughs, and I think the thing that I want to break through is our culture's enemy images of really broken and damaged and suffering people. And the thing that I want to ask you more than anything is if you try to let yourself have that terrifying moment that I had when I forgave my mother. I can almost only describe it as this kind of excruciatingly vulnerable experience of letting down the anger armor and taking apart the blame armature and just softening your gaze and allowing for the possibility that every person, no matter how far gone they seem, has a fragileness and a humanity exactly like yours. And I think this kind of change is really scary because I think that our hate kind of holds us together, you know, keeps us tough and plowing through the day. And, what, and, and when you lose the ability to blame and to vilify and to make an enemy out of someone, what happens is that all of a sudden, all of this grief for what they must have been through in their life just comes rushing straight through your heart. And it feels like it's going to be too much to bear, but I promise you that it's not. We all have it in us. So my mother didn't live in the world that I've been describing, and she didn't survive very well in the world that we're living in now. And I think we can do this better. Thank you.